This is Startup Health TV. I'm with Howard Krein, Chief Medical Officer, for a, uh, an informal chat about what is new, what is up, and um, it's good to be with you. How are you doing? Likewise, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's, uh, it's been a, certainly an interesting uh, few months, and uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting and fun to sort of hopefully see some changes and maybe some, uh, a little bit more opening and freedoms, uh, but yet uh, trying, to, uh, trying to stay safe and, uh, and protect everybody. I'm, I'm hearing a tone of optimism in your voice, which is very refreshing. Not, not that it's refreshing. No, I wouldn't expect it from yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. Because just... I'm never optimistic. Uh, you, you know, I, you I'll are, tell you, but, I, you I know. think that, um, you know, I think that uh, all the work that uh, everybody has done, you know, and the, the, you know, the public, uh, in social distancing and uh, and trying to limit exposures ha has really worked. Um, I think that you know we're not out of the woods by any by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I do think that uh, there is reason to be hopeful that uh, that slowly um, we'll be able to get back to, and I'm not going to say normal, but a, a, a new norm. Yeah, you know, I was reading yesterday or two days ago about a. Um politician in Canada who's being applauded for his forward thinking and his, you know, policies he's, he created. And it was the first time when I read his policy, it was the first time that I read more explicitly this idea of creating, of going from your family unit to a, a two family bubble, kind of like slowly expanding your social circle. Yeah. It, and I, I wondered if, if you'd ever given that any thought. I, I'd heard people talk about that, but then he actually had it in his rollout, like go from one family to two families. Yeah. You know, I think that we've been talking about that for a while, right? How do you, how do you um, expand, as you said, your, your little bubble, right? A lot of people have been isolated. Um, a lot of states, uh, including uh, Philadelphia, New Jersey, and I oh, should say Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, New Jersey, and Delaware are still in uh, stay at home orders. Um, but what do we do as we can slowly start uh, expanding um, our, our, our circles? And I, I think that's going to be the only way. I think the biggest thing is going to be um, doing it safely. And remember, if we are careful, if we protect ourselves, if we protect others by wearing masks, if we wash our hands, if we wipe down um, you know, objects and things that we're bringing in from the outside. There's no reason that we can't slowly start to expand our circle. I, I definitely like the, uh, the uh, two family bubble and then maybe a three family bubble. But remember, the bubble is only as strong as its weakest link. So if somebody outside that bubble, or I should say inside that bubble, is not following the, the, uh, the recommendations the way they should, it really puts everybody at risk. So it's a, I think it's an opportunity to slowly expand, but uh, also um, be responsible and say, uh, as we do this, let's protect ourselves, our families, and our loved ones um, by continuing to maintain the, the uh, precautions. Yeah. So one of the nice things about these check-ins with you is to get these snapshots of actual life there at Jefferson. You're in Philadelphia, you're a practicing surgeon, and you're dealing with policies at the hospital level. So where are we at today? How have things changed um, uh, policy-wise over the last, three, uh, last week or two, if they have? Sure. So currently we're trying to, as I think most uh, places in the country, are trying to figure out how do we expand services, right? So up until um, truly about this week, we were at a no elective surgeries, um, um, minimal or no um, patients coming into the office to decrease exposures to both patients and obviously staff. Um, and I think part of that was also to make sure that we had the resources to put to towards the people who really needed it, right? The, the COVID positive patients that were coming in, make sure that we had resources, whether it was PPEs, ventilators, even staff um, to be able to deal with that, right? If we, even if, if you think about staff as a resource, um, if we had a big um, outbreak and we had a, a large amount of staff out, we wouldn't be able to, to take care of uh, our patients. So yeah. um, 
we've done, a, I think, a pretty good job of that over the last uh, few months uh, and really have sort of emerged out of that, like, that, that, um, that, that point where we're worried about every day. Now we're trying to understand where this is going, how the outbreak's going to, going to affect us for the next, and we'll just use six months for, for, for a, uh, as a time frame, uh, because everything does change week to week, um, but we do have to start to really plan. And where we are is um, at Jefferson and most universities in Pennsylvania, or should the hospital systems in Pennsylvania are saying, all right, let's start working on this backlog of patients, right? Because even when you say elective surgery, we're not talking about, you know, just cosmetics. No. <laughs> we're about everything. It's, it's, it's kind of a false term, really. It really is. All yeah. elective surgery means is that the patient's right now electing to do it. It could be a very necessary surgery, skin cancers, um, reconstruction for cancers. Those are all considered elective surgeries um, on some level. Would you say, it's a really important point because when people hear that, they have no idea what elective means. They do think a, a aesthetic you know, surgery, which is not true, I know. Um, is the definition like just if you can delay it will be delayed. Like if you can, if you can possibly delay it, is that was that the idea? Absolutely. So for elective surgery, for the most part, almost almost anything except a life saving surgery could be considered on some terms elective. Um, I have patients who have you know tumors that we recommend them come out, like a benign tumor, let's say the parotid gland, um, and we say you know what you got it. You, you should really get this. Uh, um, uh, out or addressed within the next three months. That's an elective surgery. The patient gets to elect when they want to do it. The patient might say, well, you know what, because of work or I have my daughter's wedding or, you know, I have to, you know, I, I'm, I'm finishing up with school and uh, I, you know, it'd be best if I do it over the summer. Great. That's when they're going to do it. But it, it, it doesn't mean it's unnecessary. Yeah. It just means it's elective. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting because so many people are confused about, um, about that term and what it means when we say we're, we're, we're starting back with elective surgery. So this week was really my first week back as elective surgery. We kept it light um, and, uh, you know, because we want to protect the patients, we want to protect the staff. All the systems are being reworked at the hospital to make sure the patient is tested, making sure that uh, they're able to get to the hospital and get home in a safe manner while limiting the exposure to family and friends by having them wait at the hospital. So we're really starting to um, uh, sort of rework all of, the, all of these systems. And because of that, we're starting slowly. Give me an example of some of those steps. Um, they're getting tested, the, what, just temperature or they're actually getting tested? No, no, we're, right now we're testing all, so, Remember, when you're doing, sir, at least for, for what we're doing, so, uh, and we, it would be nice if we could do this in the office too. We don't have the, the facilities or the capacity for the testing of every patient coming into the office right now. But for surgery, what we've elected to do is um, every patient who's coming in for surgery sounds a, you know, an extreme emergency where you just can't test. Um, we're testing the patient um, within 24 hours, 36 at the max, but 24 hours of coming in. So the day before the patient is um, going, getting tested, so we can have the result before they come into the hospital. And that at least gives us, it's, it's not perfect, but it at least gives us some level of comfort of, okay, well, at least the patient was negative yesterday. They could have, could have gotten exposed today, but even if they did, it's probably going to be a smaller viral, viral load because they were negative yesterday. Um, um, now, we still use the same precautions when we're operating, uh, and that is because you know, we're, we're basically in the operating room with whether intubated or not, uh, but um, we use the same precautions, you know, full universal precautions, and um, we're also operating in N95 masks just to be safe. Because again, the testing is not a hundred percent. Just to paint a picture for a just the non-initiated viewer, uh, are we talking like full full hazmat? You know, people see the pictures of the of the emergency physicians, yeah. face shield, you know, yellow suit. I mean, are you gowned up like that when you're doing surgery? 
Yeah, so universal precautions for surgery is always eye protection, face protection, and gowns and gloves, right? So if you think about what we've been doing for years uh, in the operating room, um, universal precautions are were put into place to say, uh, assume every patient has a communicable disease and protect yourself. So again, so our universal precautions are always in place. Now, for certain things, intubation of a COVID positive patient and even a COVID suspected patient is done a little bit differently. We have intubation cubes. For those kind of things, absolutely, there's an additional face shield involved as well um, to prevent uh, whether it's a tracheostomy or if you're doing an intubation for aerosolate, aerosolization mm-hmm. of uh, a possible viral uh, contaminants. How much does that additional face shield, uh, that additional PPE make your job more difficult? Yeah, listen, it's not comfortable. It's, uh, you know, you, you, it's funny, we, you can always tell when somebody walks out of a, of a long case because um, they're, they're exhausted. But now um, when they walk out of a long case, if they ha- when they go to take their thing, you can literally see the, you know, the deep marks mm-hmm. of the N95. If they have a face shield, you see this big band across, you know, across their forehead. So it, is, it makes it a little bit more difficult. But the amazing thing is... Uh, um, which we always we always say when you're in surgery, you know, there's a there's this sort of um, focus that is unlike anywhere else. Where you know it, do, it doesn't matter what's going on, how you're feeling, uh, your concentration is 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 on the patient and and the operation. So those, those lines, those are the war wounds of 2020. Those are the uh, battle scars. You know, it's funny. It really has become, and uh, the nurses in the office. Uh, people are starting to actually, you know, get almost like chafing in these areas because we're wearing them so much. um, And uh, obviously our skin's not used to it. So uh, we do our best to, to, you know, to, to, to try to protect ourselves from even the the skin breakdowns and stuff, but yeah, they're definitely war wounds. So you've been involved in, in hospital level planning for, for weeks now. And we, we did our first one of these updates maybe six weeks ago today. What's my calendar say? May 13th. Are we, are we better or worse off now than you thought we would be, let's say, six weeks ago? How are you feeling right now thinking about our trajectory and your hospital planning? Um, I think that, so, you know, you can talk about uh, locally in Philadelphia versus regionally versus- That's what I mean. I, I mean, in, in your situation. Yeah, in our situation, I think that we're where we were hoping we would be, but very unsure. And that is, um, we think we got past the the you know the peak. We are definitely on the on the down slope, although it's it's still relatively new. Our hope is that we continue to trend downwards. Now, deaths are sort of lagging behind um, current infections in this in this region, but but that's expected. Um, so my, I. Th- hoped we would be and that is um, we've gotten through the peak we didn't have anybody die because of lack of access to ventilators Mm -hmm. now we learned a lot in the last few weeks um, but at least we didn't have any access deaths and uh, at this point I don't think that in at least again in this small region um, we're going to see that hopefully we won't see that through the country but the hope is now that, uh, again, that we'll be able to maintain this as we go through summer and then into fall and, and into the flu season of next, of next yeah. year. C- can we stay here? Yeah, yeah. Um, are you involved in that conversation outside of Philadelphia in such a way that you have any thoughts on kind of where that trajectory is going elsewhere? Um, yeah, I am. I'm on a couple of different um, health policy and COVID uh, teams uh, throughout uh, that, that look at things at a more national level. Um, you know, I think that the biggest thing um, that I would say about what's going on um, and how we protect ourselves nationally is uh, planning, 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 um, you know, without, uh, without getting political and saying um, there's been poor planning. We need to definitively have um, logistics in place to help us deal with the inevitable um, 
resurgence that's going to be coming, whether it's, uh, you know, this summer. Now, hopefully everything that we found out, you know, just like flu season, that we're going to see a quelling maybe down in the summer. Certainly, as long as we continue to stay socially, socially distanced and follow these precautions. The biggest question, though, is can we do that? And you're starting to see, you know, certain cities and, and, and areas open up. The biggest thing that we need to do is data collect, evaluate, and make the appropriate choices um, based on the data, not based on hope, not based on wishes, but based on the data. If we can see that we can safely open up, um, whether it's hospitals or you know parks, beaches, whatever, whatever it is, collect the data, crunch the data, make a decision. And it's how we do it in medicine. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I know it's too early to tell, but this week I read an op-ed in Forbes that really called the uh, ramp up of digital health adoption right now more of a bubble. And you, you'll get people on both sides of that equation. Uh, yeah. Will it really stick? Will it not? Uh, are you starting to get a sense now? And obviously it's a mix of the two things. Some things will, some things won't. Are you starting to get an early sign now of the things that you think within your practice and within your universe are, are definitely not going back to the way they were before? Yeah, I'm gonna go on record and say, and I've been saying this for a while, but I don't know if I ever have been more sure that the changes that we're seeing in healthcare in general are gonna stick and are gonna become more prevalent and more ubiquitous throughout medicine, period. What we've seen, and our hand was forced, I think we talked about this a few weeks ago, um, just if you talk about telemedicine, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the adoption of telemedicine into healthcare has been so extraordinarily slow for a product that had so much and has so much potential. If you think about it in, in the context of any other industry, it would have been accepted, it would have been used, and if you didn't accept it, your company would have been down here while other companies thrived. And you didn't see that in medicine. It is a, it, you know, I wish I could sit, sit here and say as physicians, as healthcare um, workers, um, that we are ready to change and accept the technology um, the way we should. And it's, it's sad to me that I still see on a daily basis um, throughout, whether it's here in Philadelphia, whether it's regionally at other health systems, or whether it's uh, domestically, um, the call for innovation with the roadblock for innovation. They're saying, come on, we, we, let's bring it in. Let's, let's innovate. There's better ways of doing this. Let's go. And then you bring the product, you bring the idea, and they go, well, you know, let's slow down for a second because we really have to get make sure that it, it works under this circumstance and this circumstance and this circumstance. Yeah. What we're seeing is, and you're seeing it with the government too, um, the FDA is fast-tracking things right now, yeah. right? Why aren't we doing the same thing in healthcare in he at the health system level? And uh, unfortunately, we're just not. As much as people want to try to pretend we are, we're not. Hmm. So you, so you sort of said both things. You said it's happening and it's here to stay, but we're also not fast tracking. So there's still oh. a big problem. Oh, absolutely. Listen, it, that's my, that's that's the the sort of the conundrum. It is absolutely happening and here to stay. The 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 I think the real goal here is how do we bring it on, bring it on safely but make sure that we're, we're, we're bringing it on in a, in, a, in, a, um, in a rapid way to help people, to help change healthcare, to innovate within this health system, um, but, uh, but force the, the sort of the adoption of it. I don't think there's any question that whether it's telemedicine, wearables, um, or other types of digital solutions, are going to be ubiquitous. It's just a matter of getting them in. So I, my, my, the answer is 100% they're here to stay. 100% it's going to happen. The question is, is it going to happen quick enough? 
Yeah. But it will happen. I'm going to walk you through, I'm going to give you a startup health without any warning. I'm going to give you a startup health portfolio uh, lightning round and talk about a few of the stories that we just published uh, and just get your quick thoughts. So the first one I'm going to, I'm going to mention is I interviewed um, a founder named Ali Kassirer, the head of a company called Robin, that's doing a digital platform for um, uh, expecting, aspiring, and new parents, I think she said. And you know, the, here, here's a, an area of health where we're, we're definitely used to doing in-person visits. And the first time that they created a digital birthing class, they had 700 people show up. So you think about people who don't have access to that kind of education, all of a sudden having it be free and, and available. And, and this being one of those areas that's just kind of lagging behind. It's just not known to be a tech forward industry. Sure. And yet the first time they kind of flipped that switch, they found this enormous, enormous uh, demand. I don't know if you have any so, thoughts on that. Yeah. And so my thoughts on that are, right? Absolutely. 700, you're able to affect 700 people. It's interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually just step back for a second and say, this is the exact reason um, I, I am so proud to be the CMO of, of Startup Health. As a physician, and I'm just going to, as a physician, as a surgeon, I can only affect a certain number of people a day, a week, a month, and a year. That's right. What I'm able to do with startup health and with digital medicine is we can affect thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, and sometimes even billions of people if we get this right. Yeah. And so what you're seeing with that company is exactly Taking something that was, only, and if you just stop at and, and think about the underserved, underprivileged communities that don't have access to this kind of, of teaching and learning and community on a daily basis, um, just that side of this uh, of this company is going to change. Um, um, uh, maternity and and birthing, and so and I, and I know they're bringing in like the very best. I mean, it's sort of like how Yale made their most popular class of all time free to everyone. It's like right. not only is the access opening up, but the quality of what you're getting is like the top. Because well, why wouldn't you? If you're just going to shoot it once and share it with everyone, get a good teacher. Absolutely. Well, isn't that what we're seeing in education now too, right? I'll look at the, how many colleges, right? I, I, it's funny because when I, you know, a hundred years ago when I went to college, I don't even think that there, you know, there weren't any online colleges. Then there was like University of Phoenix had done it. I mean, they were sort of like, they, you know, you would there see- There wasn't that. an internet when you were at college. There yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, actually, you know what the funny thing is? I'll even give you I still remember being in the bookstore and I, I met, I standing in line and I was talking to a guy and he said, uh, oh, you know, freshman. And he said, uh, oh, what are, you, what are you studying? I was like, oh, I'm a bio major. How about you? And he said, computer science. And I said, what the hell are you going to do with that? And I'm like, computer, <laughs> what? Like, what is computer science? He was like, oh, no, it's, you know, the internet. Never. So, and then and I actually walked away thinking, gosh, yeah, I guess he's not going to have a job. But, uh, <laughs> he's probably a billionaire and retired by now. So Possibly. So next one on your lightning round is uh, I just put a quick piece out about one of our newest companies and our newest health transformer, um, a guy named Tim Fitzpatrick from a company called Icona Health. And uh, an interesting application of virtual reality. He's using um, so it turns out that one of the big challenges in dialysis is uh, needing to get folks uh, to transition to in-home care. In fact, there's a national uh, mandate that we have to transition to 80% in-home for cost and quality reasons over, the, over a few years. And there's huge implications, positive implications, if we can do that. But these dialysis centers are really under-resourced and there's just no way of educating folks and helping them transition. So Icona is using um, virtual reality, using these really well-shot um, modules, these educational modules to just put it on somebody's head and letting them uh, watch the transition to in-home care, understand all the aspects of it. And um, they, they are able to take a dialysis center from like, 
I don't know, like 5% matriculation to 75% matriculation just by just letting them experience kind of that care that they need and answering all their questions through that environment. So just a really interesting sort of scalable approach to, you know, they describe it as giving people confidence. And there's, I don't know, you probably have thoughts, but I, it feels like there's so many other applications for that throughout healthcare in education and confidence building. Yeah. Um, first off, I am a huge fan of VR. Um, and I'll give you a personal story too. Let me just say what they're doing, I think is, uh, is amazing. I think it's necessary. And it is a, a way of familiarizing and helping patients become comfortable with really scary things. Um, so they're doing it for dialysis. There's, uh, there's companies that are doing it for radiation, for chemotherapy, and for surgery. So you have, and I'll just use for, you know, whether it's dialysis at home or radiation. Um, can you imagine if the first time you walk into the building for radiation, you've already been there? You feel like, oh, okay, I know where I'm going. When you lay down on the, on the table to receive your radiation, which is a scary, horrible um, uh, experience, if you were like, oh, I, I, I know exactly what to expect. And this is what they're doing with dialysis. I'm going to just give a quick story on VR. Um, I, you know, I have an Oculus, which I love. Um, but probably eight months ago, uh, and maybe, yeah, about eight months ago, I went to Machu Picchu. And prior to going, I had actually downloaded a tour of Machu Picchu on, you know, on the Oculus. When I got there, I literally knew where every, I was like, oh, yeah, that, there's a restaurant over there. And that's where the trail goes in. And the funny thing is, and they walked you right through the trails that I actually walked on. And as I walked, if there were things that I like that stuck out to me, when I came home, I actually went and they were still right there. Like I literally felt like I had already had the experience. Mm. Um, and I think that uh, a company like, uh, like uh, uh, Icona exemplifies that. And I think that the, the, usage, the usages and the, the, the potential for a company like that and for what VR can do in healthcare is unlimited. Uh, are there movements to use it in your areas of surgery? Uh, is that on the on the horizon? Oh, absolutely. So, for, first off, just from just off also from um, consenting and making sure patients understand things. Yeah. Um, to having already walked into and seen the OR and and potentially even the entire OR team. Can you imagine if I have? you know, my, my team and I say, Hey, listen, this is what we're going to do. You're going to be wheeled in here. And I give the patient the actual experience yeah. to, to have at in the safety of their own home, the comfort of their own home with the, in the safety with their family to say, Oh, I know what to expect. I think it really um, can make a huge change and difference in, uh, in, in mental health and in anxiety, fear, everything else of, uh, of, of medicine. Yeah. One thing I think is interesting about it is that um, in some ways it kind of dials back the technical expectations of VR. I've seen a lot of, uh, and, and there are still promising uses for training and for, you know, simulations in surgery. Yeah. And there's some very forward looking ideas for VR and the idea of saying, oh no, there's some actual things we can use this for now. Yep. You know, we, we don't have to be thinking 15 years in advance about uh, simulated surgery. Yeah. And, and let me tell you, that's not even 15 years. In it. I, I uh, test piloted, you know, test piloted, I tested, beta tested a, uh, for a company that had VR for uh, doing surgery. And basically all of the scans are loaded in, they're digitized into a three-dimensional image and literally using VR and, and, the, and the handsets, you can go in and visualize the tumor within the skull, whether it's in the temporal bone, in, you know, uh, in, in, you know in, in the nasal cavity, in the throat, and actually move it and see where structures are, are actually located next to it. So when you go in to do the surgery, when I'm doing my approach, I can say, okay, I know that the carotid artery was pushed over and is going to be lying right on top of this tumor. I already saw it. And there you go, you open it up and, and, and safely you're able to, 
move the tumor without uh, injuring the carotid artery because you knew where it was. It's, it's amazing. Crazy. So but, and again, and this is why I say this, this technology is here to stay. It's just a matter of, of us really accepting it and, and moving forward. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'm going to end it there just because I could take all your whole afternoon, but I know you have things you have to do. Listen, I love, this is, this is my favorite stuff to talk about. So it's, uh, any, it, any, it is, it's so any, fun. Any final words of wisdom, safety, uh, health or otherwise for our viewers or our entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think, uh, the, the word, the words of, uh, uh, in the, for safety, I would say, please, please understand that this is far from over. It might seem like it's getting better, which it is, but understand it, we can take a step backwards very quickly. And this is people's lives. This is, you know, even if you think, well, I'm, I'm fine, I'm gonna be fine, I'm young, I'm healthy. Remember, you have loved ones that are more vulnerable and that are at risk. Um, and you, people can easily spread this without even knowing. So please continue to, wear your mask, socially distance, uh, and wash your hands. And if we do this, I promise you we'll get through it, but, uh, but we all have to participate. All right, Howard. Dr. Krein, thanks for the time. As always, stay well. Thank you, Logan. Take care. Take care.